Sometimes the most compelling works of art aren't found in a museum or centered conspicuously in a public plaza somewhere. Instead, you find them in much more mundane spots, like here on this otherwise inconspicuous sidewalk. I'm on a northern neighborhood of Chicago, and this little square of concrete boasts a sculptural figure that is so strange that it sparked intense curiosity and speculation, amusement, and a surprising amount of a community engagement. The imprint is more than just an anonymous glitch in the otherwise humorless network of urban infrastructure. It has a name. It's affectionately called the Chicago Rat Hole. Its popularity was initially concentrated within a small radius of folks who would walk through here or run through here. But recently, its presence has been broadcast through news stories and social media posts. The Chicago Rat Hole. The Chicago Rat Hole. It's the Chicago Rat Hole. Its virality is this strange concoction of capturing the strangeness of urban life in general, art and memetics. An accidental impression of a rodent has morphed into a site of pilgrimage and a locus for an urban mythology that draws people to leave tributes and even celebrate life's milestones here. But why? What elevates this simple rodent imprint to the status of an urban landmark? So while I parse my thoughts on the way back home from my rat hole pilgrimage here, I'm gonna pass you over to Tirzu to be able to explain his interpretation of the events that led to this serendipitous work of art. So here's how I believe the Chicago rat hole may have come to be. On a warm, sunny afternoon, a small creature scurries across a power line over to the roof of a nearby building. While you may assume this story is about a rat, the rodent in question is actually a squirrel. Our squirrel is surveying the area, scanning for nuts to bury and bird feeders to burglarize. Because of all the construction going on, pickings are slim. However, he's not the only one looking for food. In a nearby tree, a red-tailed hawk spots the squirrel. The hawk takes off and swoops down, its razor-sharp talons ready to eviscerate the squirrel. Squirrels do not have armor, and they don't have strong weapons to retaliate with. What they do have is incredible reflexes. At what seems like the last possible moment, the squirrel detects the incoming attack and selects the only option available, diving straight down off of the roof. For many creatures, this action would only amount to choosing one death over another. But squirrels have a very low terminal velocity and can survive falls from incredible heights. But in addition to that, instead of landing on hard pavement, our squirrel finds himself landing with a splash, having fallen into freshly poured concrete. While his fur leaves no imprint, his actual body, including the thin part of his tail, leaves a mark on the sidewalk that will last for decades to come. Let's just take a short pause for a second and consider the comic tragedy of this hapless creature. A squirrel miraculously survives an animal attack. Then, due to some weird video game physics that only applies to small animals, this creature survives its insane fall, only to be immortalized in concrete, frozen in its most vulnerable pose, spread eagle on the pavement. It's the world's most epic belly flop. And then, adding insult to injury, it's mistaken for a rat ever since. I have to say that I kind of feel bad for the little guy. I even brought a little reminder that I keep on my desk these days. Maybe it's this kind of empathy that we feel to this unwitting star of the story that has turned the rat hole into such a viral urban legend. This thing has been mentioned in the same breath as iconic Chicago landmarks like the Picasso sculpture and Cloudgate, and you might also know it as the Bean. Sure, these comparisons are made mostly in jest, but I think that begs a question. What if we view the rat hole as, as a piece of public art? So I designed a three-part plan to investigate. The first part was just to understand what happened. Thanks, Tirzu. The second was to create a replica of the rat hole as if it were a piece of art. This will give us a window into how it could be made by humans. And finally, I pretended that the rat hole was art, and then I contemplated its meaning and the other art that it might be related to. But next up, the replica. And this led me to collaborate with Adam Labarge, an artist with a gift for capturing and immortalizing transient conditions and more permanent and fixed state of cast materials. I asked Adam to create an exact replica of the rat hole and record his thoughts along the way. My hope is that the artistic process of replicating and interpreting the rat hole will lead to a deeper level of understanding overall for how this humble little piece of sidewalk has found such a cultural significance overall. Adam's approach is methodical as well as being a little bit creative. It begins with a detailed 3D scan followed by some modeling refinement then moving into 3D printing a mold that captures the forms and important surface textures. Just got a notification that our 3D prints are done and ready to be picked up. And then here is our positive. This is gonna be used to make the negative of the mold. 
The final piece is cast in concrete and finished with a layer of painting and other surface refinements until the new version is indistinguishable from the original. Contrast that process with all the events that Tirzu explained, and the gap between art and life it feels a little bit absurd. But in Adam's hands, this physical double, it's, it's not just a copy. I think it's an exploration of the space between art and the accidental beauty of our surroundings. We'll check back in and see the results of the artistic replication of the rat hole more toward the end of the video. For now, let's dive into what it might mean. In the world of art and architecture, the rat hole could be considered a unique piece of intaglio sculpture. That's when you create a design by etching it into the surface of a substrate material. The thing that you're depicting is recessed or sunken in but it's not fully three-dimensionalized. It's like halfway between an image of something and a, and a full three-dimensional sculpture. Think of it as the opposite of what you see on a coin, where the figures pop out at you. That's called bas-relief. The rat hole, on the other hand, is a sunken relief. It presses inward rather than bulging outward, offering a subtle depth that captures shadow and provides enough cues to be able to interpret visual depth. This kind of artwork isn't as common as its raised counterpart but it does have a rich history that traces all the way back to ancient Egypt, particularly during the Amarna period. That's about 1300 BC, when you might find an intaglio sculpture of gods carved into sandstone. But the Red Hall obviously wasn't meticulously chiseled by an artist. It was accidentally cast into the surface of the Chicago sidewalk. The imprinting must have happened within, I think, about an hour or two of the initial concrete pouring. And while it took only a fraction of a second to make this piece, this imprint has endured for almost, I think, about 15 years now. Here is a photo taken from 2011. You can tell by the over-reliance on Instagram filters which help confirm its vintage. Anyway, this rat intaglio must have charmed countless people over its lifetime. Otherwise, it wouldn't have endured this long. It's as if there's been a silent agreement among everyone, from the initial construction crews to local residents, to be able to preserve this charming imperfection. But it hasn't sat static for this whole time. Over the years, it's evolved. Its details have been softening, its outline blurring a little bit, yet the rat still remains pretty recognizable. But today, ironically, its popularity is the greatest threat that it's facing. The increased activity isn't welcomed by its unwitting neighbors. They didn't bargain on this. One contrarian looking to spoil the fun tried to fill it in one day, only for it to be cleared out the next. So as a piece of art that maybe you might be relating to, we might understand the piece as something that has overcome overwhelming odds. The rodent survived, not only living out the rest of its life after the incident, but the imprint has lasted longer than it should have too. It's resilient. And while the rodent has certainly died years ago, he left a mark that's outlasted its short stay on Earth. And this puts the rat hole in conversation with artists who practice land art. Land art became a popular anti-establishment movement in the 1960s and the 70s. The goal was to take art out of the museum building and then put it out into the world, where the earth itself becomes the medium of art. Think about pieces like Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty. It's a monumental coil of earth and rock that spirals into the Great Salt Lake in Utah. The land is formed directly and intentionally by the artists and through trucks. And since the piece lives out in the world, it's subject to all the forces of nature. In one sense, it feels monumental because it's shaping the earth itself. But on the other hand, it's fleeting. It won't be here forever. In each visit that you make to the piece, you'll ultimately find it in a more and more advanced state of its undoing. More specifically, though, the rat hole might be seen as borrowing the land art techniques of Michael Heiser and experimenting with the themes of maybe Richard Long. Heiser's earthworks redefine the landscape with subtracted forms, just like the rat hole. They vary in scale from gigantic to relatively human-scaled carvings in the ground. Richard Long, on the other hand, would take these long walks across various kinds of landscapes, leaving trails behind as a form of art. These are all about the process and the movement and then the story told by the wake of the interventions that he leaves behind. The rat hole could be understood as a vertical interpretation of this process, its interaction caught with a single impression that prompts us to consider the events before and after the captured snapshot. In this way, the impression is what we in architecture call an index or a trace. That's when you see that something has been there or that an action has taken place based on a mark that's been left behind. 
We understand the events that Tirzu explained, for instance, because the squirrel was in physical contact with the concrete and then left behind a physical mark or a trace. You know, that might sound pretty obvious or rudimentary, but it gains a complexity the more that you think about it. The imprint in this case is a sign of the rodent. And the word sign is used specifically to refer to the physical thing that carries meaning. In this case, the scenario of the falling rodent or the rodent itself. But the imprint isn't the rodent itself, but it points to its existence. The American philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce developed a theory of signs, and the index is one of those kinds of signs. And it's joined by other kinds of signs, like ones that look like the thing that's being conveyed, like this rubber rat. It's called an icon of a rat. It's not a rat, but it looks like one. So it's conveying ideas about rats. The final kind of sign is purely associative, like how rats might be a symbol for something else. For instance, how a double-crossing mobster might be associated with a rat. I got this rat. It's purely associative. There's no physical resemblance or other qualities that connect the two things. And rats are powerful symbols. And like other symbols that resonate broadly, different people are able to interpret them in their own way. They don't mean exactly the same thing to everyone that sees them. For some, rats are seen as pests or symbols of filth or disease, while in other cultures they might be revered. For instance, as part of the Chinese zodiac, the year of the rat signifies new beginnings and wealth. Sometimes on the street, I'll see a giant inflatable rat. They're used by striking union workers to depict the unscrupulous management class that's exploiting them. This particular depiction, though, is named Scabby. Scabby was first used here in Illinois by the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150 in Plainfield, Illinois, in 1989. Its job was to draw attention to their cause, and passersby would ask a lot of questions and engage because of this giant, strange rat that was on the sidewalk. They started mass producing scabbies just for this purpose here in Illinois, and today, Big Sky Balloon and Searchlight are still the most popular makers of scabby, and they sell about 100 per year. Beyond this, Chicago is perennially ranked as one of the rattiest city in the country. At this point, the animals only really live around humans and within the environments that we build for ourselves. They come out mostly at night though and remind us that there's all sorts of activities and other things that are going on in our cities that we don't really readily experience on an everyday basis. They remind us about the complex relationship that we have to nature as well. And in some ways, the rat hole is like an important work of art. Its authenticity and scale is relatable to us. While it wasn't produced through traditional artistic practices, it, it takes the form of some pretty tried and true techniques. Elevating unlikely heroes like our little rat friend here, it's an important role for art overall. And it's clearly something that Chicagoans and maybe the entire world needs right now. So maybe that's what the rat hole does and why it's just so popular. Art gives us a pretty good lens from which to understand it. While our replica is certainly beautiful, it's missing some of the spontaneity and maybe the occasion of the original. And I think our replica, it's pretty glorious. While it's a bit softer in its features and the materiality is just a little bit more uniform than the real thing, it captures the absurdity of the situation while honoring our fallen rodent. And if you stay tuned to the end, I'll explain exactly how you can get your very own. When planning a pilgrimage to the rat hole or anywhere else, it's important to keep peace of mind while using public infrastructure and Wi-Fi. It can be a little sketchy out there connecting to Wi-Fi networks that you just don't know. And that's why I travel with NordVPN on all of my devices. It protects from something called man-in-the-middle attacks, basically scam networks that you connect to inadvertently while they eavesdrop and siphon information like passwords. Also, while traveling with NordVPN, I'm always able to connect to a server back home if I'm out of country. That's come in huge when I travel abroad and would have lost access to certain US-only websites. With just a single subscription, you gain access to more than 5,600 servers in 59 countries across six of your devices. So I'm worry-free whether I'm on my personal phone or iPad or on my work computer, no matter where I am. On top of all that, NordVPN's threat protection offers added peace of mind by blocking intrusive ads and web trackers so that my content, my work, and myself can stay safe. So go to nordvpn.com slash Stuart Hicks to get a two-year plan. You get a huge exclusive discount on top of an extra four months for free if you use my link. And the best part is that it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. So you have nothing to lose. 
You also won't lose if you stuck around because you wanted to get your hands on your very own rat hole replica. We loved making this thing, so we decided to make another 25 of them, and one could be yours. Each life-size and materially accurate concrete replica is numbered and hand-finished for a fine surface texture. These are available for only $100 plus shipping. The link is down in the description right next to that NordVPN link. So sign up there and then head over to get your rat hole before they sell out. Thanks for watching.